remittances, in fact, is the, is the number one or number two foreign exchange earner. That more foreign exchange come into some countries from remittances than exports through tourism and other sectors. So yes, there is that history of the exportation of labor uh, in the circuit of capital returning wealth to the societies. This, this, is, this is well known. But in small islands where uh, traditional natural resources, traditional such as um, bauxite, oil, and so on, where those traditional natural resources are either limited or non-existent, then what you have going for you is a human resource. And if you're going to build an economy which is sophisticated around the human resource, whether it is in financial services or whether it's in tourism, you need to have a community, you need to have a population that is very sophisticated in how it responds. If you go into certain tourism-based economies, for example, in Europe, uh, you will find that there is a very detailed and very intricate and very sophisticated relationship which the citizens have to tourism and the issues related to tourism. The industries that are built around tourism, the value added that comes out of tourism, and that has to do with, again, with education, training, uh, innovation. So small economies, I believe, maybe more so than, than large economies, must invest more and more in the training of their citizens. This is particularly the case in the Caribbean, where we are trying to, we are trying to distance ourselves from the negative aspects of our history. And in, in islands where there has been uh, a tremendous amount of human degradation uh, because of the servitude that was built into our economies. Uh, and we now, have to, we now have to uproot that psychology of servitude and replace it with a psychology of, of sophisticated service. That is a psychological turn that we have to take. Education and training is the only way to, to deal with this. So, acronym, males at Cato, interesting. And we have tried to propagate that through the school systems. Now, it is true what you have said that uh, in the faculty of in the faculty of science and technology here at KPhil, there is a balanced enrollment. In most of the other faculties, there's a female majority, but in science and technology, there's a balanced enrollment. Uh, that is close to an ideal. Uh, so. In science and technology at KFO, we have a significant interest uh, by women in those disciplines. So we are pleased by that. In fact, if you, if you examine some of the high achievers uh, in that faculty, you will find that women are in the top echelons. They're doing very, very well in science and technology. There is no reason, there is no reason to assume uh, that, that there is any gender differential in interest or in capacity. I mean, it just does not exist. And we offer scholarships to women in those disciplines to pursue higher education, masters and PhDs quite, quite generously. When we move to establish the Institute for Software Engineering, we will imagine that the women who are already in high schools uh, in the science streams, the young women, will continue to press on into the university, into science and technology. Now, when we spoke about uh, the gender nature of our university, you begin by recognizing, I think, three significant facts. One, historically, there was a male imbalance. Uh, males have retreated generally from some areas of the university, not all. There is still a strong male bias in those professions where it is assumed that the income levels and the status levels will be very rewarding in a short time. So you examine the trend. The males have a predominant interest in law, in business, in medicine, um, in engineering. In those disciplines, and accountant and management, 
the, the young males are still attracted to those uh, disciplines that will generate high income and high social status. So it isn't, it isn't a general retreat from the university at all. I have never believed that to be so. I think what we are saying is that the young men, the young men are focusing maybe more specifically in a narrower, a narrower band of education. At the same time, there is a greater interest among younger men in having uh, on-job training. So a young man from high school will go to work in a bank and would try to work his way up through the bank by having seminars and workshops. In other words, acquiring knowledge, not in a big chunk, like four years at a university, but acquiring knowledge in a three-month program, a two-week program, and over time, building up their knowledge base while working and developing. This has become a male trend. Now, there are obviously sociological reasons uh, why a larger number of men are preferring to work and acquire knowledge in short doses, hoping that at the end of a process, they will have acquired the professional expertise, acquired the knowledge, while at the same time earning an income as they go. All societies are going through a similar response by a significant section of the male population. So uh, there is no need for us, I believe, to problematize that. But what you have to do is for the university and the private sector to work closely together so that we catch them, so that we, we bring them in to do these short courses for professional development as they see fit, so that we carry everyone along. At the same time, you have to congratulate uh, the women for moving affirmatively into the university. They have been historically uh, denied opportunity, a narrower space, there have been social pressures around keeping them out, but now they have taken that bold step to move aggressively into the knowledge economy, into the university. And that has to be celebrated. It has to be celebrated. We meet with prime ministers on a regular basis. We attend the CARICOM meetings. We attend the heads of the government's meetings and we are able then to sit with them in caucus and individually one-to-one. -one. So the leadership of the university is deeply embedded and prime ministerial conversations, and no doubt this will continue. But you did say that you wanted to meet with Prime Minister Stewart on a specific issue regarding the recent pronouncement by him that you were using this case as an alternative government. Well, the Prime Minister of Barbados, like all Prime Ministers, will entertain their principles and the Vice Chancellor when they are ready. They have countries to run. We have a university to operate. They have, they have countries to run. And everyone will look at their diary and we will find a suitable time to do so. I have no doubt it will happen. I derive from this. Far outstrip the cost. The, the transformation of societies and economies across the Caribbean, driven by UWI. If you consider, for example, that the, the middle class of this island of is, this large middle class that has come on stream in this country uh, in the post independence period. It is largely a UWI produced middle class. It is primarily a UWI produced middle class. And this middle class have added tremendous value to the structure of this economy and to the prosperity of the society. So across the region, you see the tremendous benefits that have been derived from having this investment in UWI and in other tertiary institutions. So yes, uh, we recognize that there is a need for us to contain, to do all we can to contain the cost of the tertiary education sector, to reduce the, the cost of education to the students and to governments. We recognize that we have to strategize to do this, and we are doing this, which is why we are uh, which is why we have developed, for example, an open campus to find a way to drive down the cost of delivery of our products. But at the same time, the benefits have been enormous to all of these societies, to this university as a strategic partner in recent years, and providing our students with internships and working experiences. But while that is true, we must not lose sight of the fundamental fact that the production of uh, a graduate is a two-phase process. 
you spend three or four or so years within the walls of the academy. And at the same time, you go into the workplace. And we imagine our, our pedagogy or our theoretical perspective is based on the assumption that the education of that student is not complete until they have spent a number of years in the workplace. Those students who are able to get that while in the university, that is excellent. But those who have not been able to get that, the employer has a responsibility to that graduate of the university to give them exposure and training on the workplace. So let us say you spend three to four years in UWI. In the three to four years you spend in the workplace, you have now completed your cycle. That is how we look at it. Now the private sector, I believe, around the world have understood that. The role of the university is to hand over an individual with a certain, a certain set of academic and intellectual skills. The employer take that product, take that university product, and hone it and transform it into an industry-specific person. The process has to be completed in two phases. Now, we have to work clearly with all of our employers in the public and the private sector to accept and embrace this concept. That it is a two plus two, it is a three plus three process, and not a singular process. They finance the university, we deliver a product, they take the product, and they hone it into the specific requirements that are needed to add value in the workplace. So that is how we are looking at it, and that's how we are encouraging our employers to, to look at it.